was. Let me just read to you a definition of Judaism, which is going to be a little boring because I'm hanging there for just a second. The Jewish religious system of works righteousness, based not primarily on Old Testament text, but on rabbinic interpretation and traditions. What is rabbinic? That's rabbis. That's the teachers of the law. So it's based on what they have said, not based on... Uh, strictly on what the Word of God says. So you have heard of my former conduct. And then he explains what that former conduct was, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. So Judaism, this, this tradition that he had, that he come from, uh, because he believed wholeheartedly and he had been taught in this, in this way so long, he said there should be no other way. But the fact is, is through Christ, it's the only way. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man shall come to the Father except through me. So when, when, we, when we hear that Paul was trying to destroy the church, it was a futile effort. It was not going to work, okay? Because uh, why is it? Why is it that it would not work? So the second point I'm, I want to point out to you is when it says he tried to destroy the church, okay? Uh, try, there's a lot of people who tried throughout the years, right? A lot of people tried to, try, tried to destroy the church. You know, uh, they were trying to destroy the church of the New Testament all the way back in the Old Testament because they were trying to destroy the lineage of David. They were trying to destroy everything that would lead down to the prophecy of Jesus being born of a virgin. Everywhere along the way in the Old Testament, it was always an effort of Satan to destroy the line that would lead to Jesus Christ. But it could not be destroyed. Why is that? Because nothing could stop the Lord Almighty is the song we just sang. Okay? Nothing's going to stop him. Okay? And so he's got his mission. He's got his purpose. And nothing's going to stop. Matter of fact, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus tells this, and he was talking to Peter, and he says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And the Jewish phrase, uh, it refers to death. Even death, the ultimate weapon of Satan, has no power to stop the church. So Paul, his efforts were going to be uh, there was no, there was only no fruit to the efforts of his trying to destroy the church. He may hinder the church, he may slow down the church, but there is not going to be anything that destroys the church of God. Okay, Jesus, it came out of his mouth to Peter, and it's never going to happen. So this was, this was futile in, in, in the effort of Paul to try to destroy the church. Okay, so as what does that mean for us? What it means for us is this. If we have, if we are those who have been called by, called by, um, by through grace to a faith in Jesus Christ, when we confess that faith, when we confess Him as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised His Son from the dead, listen, we are a part of that church and nothing will destroy that. Nothing will destroy that. Now, there are different local churches and things like that that are, um, they are, they're, I don't want to use the word segregated, but in some instances, I guess you could say they are. But they're, they're little bundles, if you will, of a larger church, okay? I mean, there's churches all over the place around here. And as long as you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, if you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a life without sin, died on the cross in our place for our sins, rose again, he's coming again, you hold to those five things, those things are... You, you, those are a closed fist, closed hand issue. If somebody says any of those things are false, they're not a believer. And they're, they're a heretical church. If there's a church that says that, that's not a true church. If you do not believe that Jesus is who he said he was, plus the Bible uh, prophesies and tells who he is, that's not a church and you're not a Christian. You got to believe those things. Now listen, you may say, well, I don't know if I believe that when I first come to faith. The Bible says we should have a childlike faith. When we first come to Christ, it's by the drawing of the Holy Spirit. It's a revelation. I'm in sin. Christ is holy. I want to be like Jesus. I want to live like him. Well, what do I got to do? Well, I got to get the sin out of my life so that I can be holy like the Savior. So what does that entail? It entails understanding who Jesus is and what he, what he did on the cross so that you may Get across that path so that you may move from being sinful to, to sinning less. 
you, you, you won't be sinless completely. You will at the moment of salvation, but we're going to sin again. But yet, Christ wants us moving toward holiness. Okay? So what happens in that is we become a part of the church by our confession that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and who the Bible says he is. And so nothing can destroy the church, the church overall. Now, unfortunately, we've seen churches close. I mean, I've, I've grew up and I've seen churches close. It's, it's unfortunate to see churches close. And, and that's not the church. That's not Satan prevailing over the church. Sometimes there's issues that happens, okay? But listen, that's not Satan prevailing over the church as a whole. So I want you to understand nothing is going to destroy the church, not even Paul in all the ways he was advanced in Judaism. And he's, he's telling you, verse 14, I was advanced beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And I want to tell you this, everyone starts in some tradition, whether re religious or irreligious. Everybody's got some kind of tradition they've come from. Okay, we've got something that we've done. And it's, it's like something, this is just what our family does. Our family does this. And, or our church has done this. And we come from something. And we believe, and, and hopefully it is true to the Word of God. It's something you should be doing. But listen, we believe because this is the way our family did it. This is right. Now, I'm not sitting here telling you you need to go question your mom and daddy and what they did and what your grandparents did and all that. But listen, Sometimes we as parents and our grandparents need to own up and say, you know what, maybe, maybe we didn't do that quite right. You know, maybe, maybe we need to work a little better to figure out what the Word of God says. So we can be, not so we can fit society, understand that. We're not going, well, I don't know if I did that right based upon what the media says. No, I don't know if I did that right based upon what the Word of God says. Because the Word of God does not change. It does not change, and, and the Bible tells you, uh, I'm trying to remember where it's at, I'm sure it's in, I believe it's in Revelation, where it says, you know, not one jot or tittle should be taken from this text. And if you know, uh, should be added or taken away from this text, what does that mean, jot or tittle? Well, that's the way they wrote in, in Greek and Hebrew. When they'd write, they had all these little dots and symbols. They'd put above and below little letters and number and, and all their stuff, and that was jots and tittles. So you're like, that's King James for making letters do what they're supposed to do, okay? So it's saying, you know, you're not supposed to take those things away, all right? So we stand on the Word of God, okay? And he advanced in Judaism. And everyone starts in some tradition, whether religious or irreligious, all right? So we're going to look at, and in verse 14 also, we're looking at Paul's resume. This is Paul's resume. He's saying, look, I have exceeded beyond them. And, and you can go back, and I believe it's, I'm trying to remember what book of the Bible it is, but Paul goes through and he talks about how he is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is, he is this and he is that, and he's talking about how, man, I am in, in line of those in, in, in Jewish thought, man, I am up there, okay? Everything that, I could, everything that you could claim is something worth attaining in this culture, I've gotten it. But you know what? He says, I count it all as dumb, as, as feces. I count it all as poo. Basically, he says, that's the way I count all this stuff that, I've, that I have garnered, that I've accomplished under man. It's nothing. It's no good. It's no good. Because the only thing that's of value is what I accomplish for Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says later on. And he, this is important for us to understand because what we accomplish in this world, although that might be great, yes, oh wow, we've done great in school academic-wise. We've done great in school in sports. Uh, we've done great in, um, in extracurricular different clubs and things like this. I was the secretary the first year, the vice president the second, uh, second year, and the third year I was the president. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But listen, you didn't get there without the help of Jesus Christ. It's, and what we do when we get there is even the most important thing. Are we going to do those things, whatever status you hold, whatever accomplishments you made, whatever placement that you have, are you using it to glorify God? Are you using it to, to lead your fellow students to Christ? To say, listen, I, I couldn't do this without Him. It's, it's only through Him that I'm able to do this. And you may... And, and, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing when you think about sports and things like that. You know, did God cause the other team to lose because I have faith in Jesus? I don't know if they do or not. They probably got Bible-believing people on their team, too. But at the same time, you know, 
God, in our salvation, in our trust in Him, when we place our faith in Him, He is working in and through us. And He's working in and through those that have called upon Him as Lord and Savior. So it's a, it's a challenging thing when you start saying stuff like that. You know, uh, I believed in Jesus, and that's the reason why I won. I saw the other day there was a, a girl that came over my sports center on my Instagram feed, and she said, uh, it was because of Christ that I won this UFC fight. And it was a woman, and I said, going, well, that's interesting, but I'm not saying she didn't, but I'm just saying it's interesting. You know, did God favor her over the other UFC fighter? I don't know. That's such a strange concept. But anyway, um, that's so interesting when you think about stuff like that. But, like, I was, it was Athlete's Corner, uh, and, and they had, I think it, that's where it is. And if you want to follow a Christian based Instagram, Athletes Corner has got that, and they've got all kind of different sports folks that, that, that uh, talk about Jesus. So anyway, advancing in those things. There are things of the world, but listen, while we are advancing in the things of the world, we need to be advancing Jesus Christ while we're advancing in the things of this world, okay? There's nothing wrong with, with getting accolades and, and being recognized and rewards and working hard and winning. There's nothing wrong with that. But the thing is, we just need to understand who gets the glory. Who gets the glory. And Paul talks about that, and he, he talks about in his resume, basically, uh, who he is. And then we look at verses 15 through the first part of verse 16. He says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me for the purpose that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now, when I was reading, there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways of looking at that when he talks about who separated me from my mother's womb. When it pleased God, it is God's will. It's, it's at God's leaning and God's desire for us to be saved. You know, People say, well, I'll come to Christ when I get older. I'll come to Christ. I've heard people say this, older people. I'll come to Christ, you know, when I have kids. I'll, I'll come to Christ. No, you won't. You'll come to Christ when Christ comes to you. And when Christ comes to you, you'll either respond in obedience or you'll respond in, in, in ignorance, not realizing what exactly you're doing and forsaking. Now, listen, I want to tell you this, too. God is under no obligation to return to somebody a second or third time to offer grace unto salvation. He's under no obligation to do that. Okay? So when I say that, I want you to understand that if you've heard the gospel, and, and many of you, I look in here, all of y'all have been in here multiple times. So you've heard the gospel multiple times. But you might have friends that your time to speak the gospel to them may be the only time they get to hear the gospel. God's not obligated to go back to them again. God's called you and me to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He doesn't say, go ye therefore, and if you're a staff member on a church, make disciples. This is to every single called out believer in Jesus Christ. It's every one of our responsibilities to share what Jesus has done in our life. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to go through every verse in Romans to explain to them how to be saved. What did Jesus do in your life? Have you been changed by Jesus? If you have, you've got a testimony. And a testimony is most of the time going to be even more powerful to your friends than any Bible verse that you could quote just out of rote memorization. Because if you've got a passion for something, you're going to write it on your heart and you're going to know it. Oh, did you know this, that, and the other? The scores, this, that, and the other? Did you know this, this, this uh, athlete, this entertainer, this singer, this person, this song, these lyrics, whatever it may be? And you're going to spout it off in a moment's notice. But if you love Jesus and you got a relationship with him, and you, somebody remotely brings up anything about Jesus, you should be out of the passion and relationship you have. Be able to tell them what Christ has done in your life. It shouldn't be complicated. It's not complicated. But we make it complicated because we don't want to do it. We make it complicated because we don't want to do it. I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. Your life is not messed up anymore. Jesus saved you. Tell them about your life. It's, it's fixed. It, you know, you're going to fail again, but it's fixed. Okay? Who separated me from my mother's womb. He called me through his grace 
Paul talks a lot about grace. I talk a lot about grace. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace, through faith that you were saved. He called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. And he did this so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Jesus Christ saved Paul to preach, uh, to preach Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Jesus saves us for the exact same reason. Now, you might say, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I've been called to preach. Paul's a little different because he's, he's set apart in a different calling. But listen, everybody who's called by Jesus Christ unto salvation, we've got a responsibility to tell people what Christ has done in our life. If you've ever, if you've ever experienced a feeling of being saved from anything in your life, then you'll understand what it means to tell somebody about it. You know, I tell the story about Hunter. I, I used that illustration the other week. Uh, I used the illustration, um, you know, I, I, I've talked about how when Brogan helped me up off that raft, get onto the boat, you know. Uh, I, I, think about, um, I, I think about when when we helped this guy years ago. I hit him. He was on a motorcycle. I was on a four-wheeler. We hit head on. And uh, we picked him up after he landed, you know, 15 yards away doing a helicopter spin. We picked him up and put him on the front of my four-wheeler, laid his motorcycle across the back, and put the other guy who was riding me up on the front and the gas tank up of his motorcycle up in the front of my four-wheeler, and I rode him home. Kind of found out the kid broke his arm. It was his own fault, really, because I had already pulled over on the side. But anyway, nonetheless, um, you know, I think about those moments of where there is an aspect of saving you know, I, I think about when I was a kid, my dad pulling me out on that big, that, I don't know, it was a weird raft. So, so, some of you guys may remember these rafts. They had like seagulls on them, and they had ropes around the edges. I don't know. Maybe y'all didn't have those. But we had these, these, these floats that were like, on one side they were slick, and on the other side they were like gritty almost. And on the gritty side they had portraits of seagulls. And I'll never forget my dad dragging me way out in the ocean. I mean way out in the ocean. And then just a big wave coming, he lets me go. And then like you get to the shoreline and you're tumbling and rolling all in the sand and holding on for dear life and, and all you're seeing is seagulls and waves, seagulls and waves. And then, who's going to save me from this? And then, and then dad comes over and he scoops me up and, and gets me up, you know, and all that kind of good stuff. And I think about all these different things about being, aspects of being saved, you know. Uh, and then when we think about Jesus Christ, he has reached down and he has saved us. You know, we're tumbling around and we're seeing everything, you know, <laughs> seagulls and waves. And, and, and God just scoops down and picks us up and he he sets us up where we're secure. And we ain't got sand in our shorts. And we got, we got the Holy Spirit in our hearts. <laughs> you know, we got good stuff, not bad stuff. And, and so, like, Jesus saves us. And he, he separates us. And he calls us. And he reveals his son in us so that we might preach him to the Gentiles. Now, listen. The next thing I want you to understand is this. Is man... Man does not confer our conversion. It is not up for me to tell you you're saved. I, I, I can't do that. You're going to reveal your salvation by the way you respond after salvation. It's not for me to say, oh, I believe you're saved. Uh, you know? N no. The Holy Spirit's going to reveal that by the fact that He indwells you and you're going to do things differently. You're going to speak differently. You're going to live differently. You're going to express yourself differently. You're going to react differently than you did before. All these different things are going to happen because the Holy Spirit is indwelling you now. It is not just self. And we're not just responding out of our own selves. And we don't have to go to somebody else and say, Hey, am I saved? Now listen, if you're struggling with your salvation, there's nothing wrong with going and asking questions. You know what I mean? There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But listen, it's not up for me to tell you you are saved. Because I can't know your heart. There's only two people that really can know your heart. That's you and Jesus. Or you and God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's only two people that can truly know your heart. 
Now, many of us that live around you, that maybe live in the same household or, or hang out with you often, we might see fruit of the change in your life. You might be more kind, more patient, more gentle, more loving, more self-control, different things like that. You're going, there's going to be a revelation. And like I said last week, you know, there's going to be different times in our lives where some of these things are going to be heightened. You know, you might sh be showing more self-control or you might be showing more patience or more kindness and things like that. That's going to that's gonna be flushed out because of the fact that you've got the Holy Spirit living within you. Verse 17, uh, the latter part of verse 16 and verse 17 is what I'm talking about there. Paul says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And when, when I think about that in, in verse 17, uh, 16 being 17, it, it's, it's, it's about getting getting just from the Lord. Guys, there's times when we need to just spend time ourselves with the Lord. If you're waiting to come here for me to pour out a picture of, of Jesus Christ on you, listen, it's going to be really tough for it to really stick. Because it's like turning on a, a fire hydrant and just trying to spray you with water and keep you soaked for an entire week. That's not going to work very well. You know what I mean? Number one, it's going to be very inconvenient. It's going to be very unpleasant because you're like, man, I'm just getting, getting drowned over here, you know. <laughs> like the song I used to say that I hated when they'd say, uh, your, your love is like a waterfall, waterfall. You know what I mean? Like really, if, if Jesus' love is like a waterfall, you're drowning, right? You know what I'm saying? Because it's great. It's huge. It's massive. The love is overwhelming. But listen, if you come in here, you, you need to be spending time daily with the Lord. Even if you just sit down and just write out a few things. I have, I've decided this week, now listen, there's been different times. At different times in your life, you'll be like, man, I'm on fire. And then there's other times you're like, man, I'm struggling. Man, I'm on fire. Man, I'm having a great Bible study time for myself, a devotional time. I'm having a great time. And then other times you might be like, man, my life's crazy busy right now, and I've totally dropped the ball. And I haven't, I haven't read my Bible in a week or two weeks or a month, you know what I mean, for myself at home. I ain't done that in a while. Listen, that's going to happen from time to time. And listen, just pray. Pray then. If, you, if you're not picking up your Bible, still have a relationship with Jesus. Talk to him. Okay? But listen, if you can, and you should, make every effort to be in the Word of God. What, I, what I've done, it helps me in the morning. Uh, the, last, the last week, uh, probably, I'd say three or four days, I have gotten my big Bible at the house, and I've got one of my little devotional books or my little journaling books, and I put it there, and it's helped me. Matter of fact, um, that's what I keep referring to here. I, I took a picture of it so I could print out some of my notes I did at breakfast one morning because I, I was like, you know what, I, I really want to get a little bit more studying in this morning and, and spend a little time in that. So I, I did that, and I printed that off so that some of those things I wrote down out of my study Bible I could use tonight. And so it's, it's important that we read and we, and we just journal. I mean, you ain't got to write nothing complicated. Just write down a couple of things that the Lord's saying to you, okay, and spend that time with the Lord. And listen, then once you've spent time yourself studying the Word and letting the Holy Spirit speak to you about what the Word's saying, then be a part. Be a part of something bigger than yourself. Be a part of student ministry. Be a part of this youth group. Be a part um, it, it, it Curry. I, I think Miss, uh, oh man, I ain't talked to her in so long. Miss Porter. Miss Porter does the A to J, or she did do it. And so like, be a part of A to J if you're at Curry. Okay, if you're at Jasper, be a part of, of the Wave or the Agape Club. Be a part of something where God is working at your school. FCA, if you've got Fellowship of Christian Athletes, whatever it may be. Be a part of those things. And you may say, well, I don't have any friends that go there. You be the first friend and let somebody follow you there. Listen, we got to quit thinking that if I ain't got a friend there, I can't do it. You be the friend to somebody else. And let somebody follow you into doing what's godly and what's good. Quit waiting on somebody else. Because one day there might not be somebody, and you've just got to do something. But if all you're going to do is wait on your friend to do it, your friend might be as, as intimidated as you are. 
Listen, we, we've got to step out there and be a part of something bigger than ourselves. So Paul, when he left Arabia and Damascus, uh, it says, Then after three years he went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, remained with him for 15 days. But then he says, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So he went up for 15 days and spent some time with Peter. Guys, you need to go spend time with people in Jesus Christ who are living for Jesus and love Jesus and, and spend time with them. If you're ever reading your Bible, I don't care what time it is, and you say, man, I don't really understand that, text me. Say, Brother Blake, what is this? I remember Garrett used to do that a, a good bit. And uh, I'm trying to remember who else used to do I think... Uh, Jonah would do that from time to time back in his younger years and, and when he was in middle school. You know, people, they would text me these questions. What in the world does this mean, you know? Anna Claire would do that. And I remember those things. And I'd text them back and I'd respond. And, and it was, you know, I enjoyed that, guys. I, I was being able to invest beyond just a few moments on a Wednesday night or a Sunday school and, or a camp or something of that nature. You know, I was being able to really invest the gospel and the good news back into our students. And if you, I'm serious, if, if you're in the morning and you've got a, and you're getting up and you're reading at 6.30, text me. Listen, my phone's usually on my nightstand right here. And if I hear a text go off, I'll usually squinch my eyes open and look over there and see, somebody just texted me. And I'll roll up and I'll see what I got. And if you've got a question for me, I'll try to answer it immediately. You know, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm here for. But he says, he stayed with him for 15 days, saw none of the apostles except James, a brother. And then he puts this caveat in here at verse 20. And he says, now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. He's telling you, listen, guys, I'm not lying to you. I've, I've done all these things. I went down here to Arabia and Damascus because at the time, you got to remember, the apostles were still scared to death of him. Remember, he was Saul. Capturing people, holding the jackets of folks, stoning. They stoned Stephen, and he's holding the jackets of all those guys who stoned him. And, and, and Stephen's sitting there saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And, and so, a young Saul is standing there holding those coats of those men that did that. And Saul, on that road to Damascus, God intervened in his life and spoke into his heart and changed him right there and, and changed his name from Saul to Paul. And, and he went on to do all these things and to write almost half of the New Testament. So here we go. In the latter part, closing us out here, verses 21 through 24. Um, this is where Paul, he has preached in Syria and Cilicia, and it's without personal interaction with any of the other apostles. And those apostles, the churches, um, the churches in Judea, which were in Christ, they glorified God because Paul preached the gospel. And so let me read these verses to you, and then I'll talk to you some more about them. Afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Uh, but, but they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorify God in me. So just a few things real quick, a few uh, things that are just... I think logistically you might think it's pretty neat. I did anyway. And a lot of times they say they, they go down. But anyway, Jerusalem is here on the map. Well, he, he was going up to Damascus when, when, when God saved him. Okay? When he, when he was... Um, and Damascus is a little north of Syria. So when Paul came to faith on the way to Damascus, he preached the gospel here. And then like if, if you were looking at a map, it kind of hooks around the sea there and, and comes over and here's Cilicia over here. So he's preaching the gospel all up in these areas up in here, north of Jerusalem. And Cilicia is west uh, to northwest of Damascus on that map. So when, when you think about that, he's, he's all up in this area. And so he was not known by the churches down in Judea, down in uh, around Jerusalem and all that stuff. So when he says, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So this is what I want you to grasp for just this small portion of, of this scripture. Our personal popularity isn't as important as the gospel's popularity. Okay? Our personal uh, popularity isn't as important as the gospel's popularity. People need to hear about what the gospel is doing, what Jesus is doing in the areas in which we are. They wouldn't have recognized him. 
Many of them had never seen him before his conversion, and they had not seen him afterwards. So they didn't know who, what to expect, many of the apostles and many in the churches of Judea. They, didn't, they were like, we don't know what this guy looks like. If he comes around, you know, should we be scared? Should we be excited? We don't know. But this is what we're hearing. This is what we're hearing. That he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. Guys, I want to tell you something. I hope that could be said of us. You and me, not that we're trying to destroy the church, but that people hear that we are preaching the gospel, that we're living for Jesus. Living for Jesus. Let's, uh, and, and when I say that, I, I, it makes me think of, I, I've got hymns all stuck in my brain from growing up. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do. Um, I can't remember the rest of it. But anyway, that's, that's, that's how we should live, striving to please him in all that we do, seeking the lost ones. Um, man, I wish I, I wish I would have thought through that a little bit more. But um, that, that is such a great classic hymn. We haven't sung it in forever. Matter of fact, I can't even think of the title of the hymn right now. So, but, but I hope that people will hear about Jesus before they hear about Blake. Although I'm preaching the gospel here, I hope they'll say, well, where did you hear about that? Well, I heard about it out of the Word of God. Would you want me to talk to you about Jesus? Don't say, I mean, you don't have to say, well, my youth pastor Blake said, I'm not as important. Jesus said. Jesus said. He's more important. My words can be fallible. My words are going to be wrong from time to time. I'm going to say goofy stuff. Trust me. Uh, Julie and the kids, they know. I don't even finish sentences half the times at the house. So, so this is the deal. <laughs> you, you don't need to uh, bank on me. You need to bank on Jesus. You need to trust in Jesus and in his word, okay? Because I'm going to say goofy stuff from time to time. But Jesus' stuff is good stuff, not goofy stuff. I say goofy stuff. Jesus says good stuff. So point them to Jesus, okay? Point people to Jesus, all right? So... Uh, it says, they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And listen, verse 24, and they glorified God in me. Now listen, they is not the lost world. Okay, this is, this is other churches. So what does that mean for us? That means that we should be celebrating when we hear other churches have success as well. We should celebrate other churches that have success. You know, when we hear that, that North Side, First Baptist, West Side, East Side, all the different churches around uh, Walker County, if they're preaching a true gospel and, 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 and they're hearing uh, and they're having a, a revival, if you will, or they're having a, a major outbreak of evangelism where, where people who are lost are coming to faith, man, that is something to rejoice over. Listen, I'm going to get to meet with some of my, my youth pastor friends tomorrow morning for breakfast. And, man, I'm looking forward to it. One of my good friends who's been here for several years, Jeremy Reese, and many of y'all that go to Jasper's, so I met him because he's helped teach the Spanish classes. He's also helped coach, uh, well, no, that was Stuart that helped coach the soccer teams. But, but Jeremy has helped a little bit, too, because of his Spanish-speaking uh, abilities. So, but Jeremy is moving to uh, North Carolina to take a position inside the inside the the ministry of their particular denomination and so um we're gonna have breakfast and hang out with him you know i think about john jay who served at first baptist and then at north side man he's man he's so faithful uh, uh he loves the lord uh, but he's he's retired but he's still serving his church and loving loving folks there and, and getting to rejoice in what christ has done in them listen i i want to glorify god when when Stuart or Philip down at Glory or, um, you know, these folks and they're saying that people are being baptized, I want to rejoice with them. We need to glorify God because God is still working and saving folks. That's awesome. And if it happens here, obviously we're going to rejoice. If it happens anywhere else, we need to rejoice. And Paul says, they were glorifying God in me. So listen, let's let God be doing something in us so that people may be glorifying God beyond us because of the work that Christ is doing all around us. Let's do that. Let's glorify God. Now listen, this is very much tonight, and 
the account of Paul. Very much about Paul. But I just want to challenge us tonight. What is it about us? What is it about us? Would people say that we are living the gospel? Are other people hearing about the work that we're doing, the, the way we're loving other people? You know, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. All the laws and prophets hang upon that command, these two commands. So we should, we should be rejoicing with others, and we should be living it out ourselves, living out our faith before others so that people may glorify God. Not to glorify me, not to glorify Farmstead Student Ministry, Lift Student Ministry, not to glorify Farmstead, not to glorify an individual church, but to glorify God in the work that they're doing. I think we can do that. I think we can live in a way that glorifies God. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. If, if you've never made, if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, and believed in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, there's no way that you're going to be able to live in a way that glorifies him, that other people are going to see that in you and glorify God. So tonight, if you have never, if you have never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and believed in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, tonight's the night that you can do that. Tonight's the night you can do that.